Welcome back to DLS 105, Risk Tools and Calculations for Risk Assessments. This is Module 2, Calculating and Portraying Risk. After completing this module, course participants should be able to demonstrate how to perform the basic calculations for quantitative dam and levy risk assessments and how to perform risk reduction evaluations. This presentation will start with a discussion of interpolation and extrapolation considerations for risk assessments. From there, we will define the different types of risks associated with dams and levees, how to calculate and portray these risks, and some common mistakes that are made. Lastly, we will discuss how we use risk to evaluate risk reduction plans and alternatives. Our first presenter will be Adam Goes from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Risk Management Center. He will cover interpolation and extrapolation. Thank you, Damon. The first topic for this session is interpolation and extrapolation. To start, why do we need to interpolate or extrapolate to begin with? When we are evaluating the performance of our infrastructure and are estimating system response probabilities, we will typically only evaluate four or five discrete loading points. We will then interpolate to calculate probabilities between those discrete points and use those interpolated probabilities as inputs in an event tree. There are several interpolation options that are available. We want to choose the method that best approximates a straight line. This is known as linearization, and because we use linear interpolation formulas, linearization makes the interpolation calculation more accurate. When a team elicitation is completed, one of the first things we do is plot the system response to look at it and make sure the shape and probabilities are reasonable. But we're also trying to decide which transformation best creates a straight line. We typically do this by visual inspection, but also consider the R squared value for our data. The three most used methods of interpolation are linear, logarithmic, and z-variate. Z-variate or logarithmic interpolation are usually appropriate for frequencies, exceedance probabilities, inflow, outflow, and system response probabilities. However, we have to be careful with system response probabilities because sometimes they're zero and you cannot take the log or the inverse of the standard normal cumulative distribution of zero. A simple workaround is whenever you have an instance where your system response probability is equal to zero, change that system response probability to something very small, like one times 10 to the minus 20, and then evaluate a stage or a loading near that zero threshold. Linear interpolation is usually appropriate for stage, ground motions, and system response probabilities for overtopping failure modes. Microsoft Excel provides a forecast function that can be used for interpolation, but Dave Margo did them one better and developed a macro with the typical interpolation functions that is very useful. The macro is preloaded into most of the spreadsheets for this course, but you can also download it from the course website so that you can use it with other spreadsheets. We will cover the macro in more detail and how to use the macro shortly in this presentation. Here's an example with a four point system response curve that is a function of peak reservoir stage. The data is plotted with three different transformations, linear, logarithmic, and z-variate, with peak stage along the x-axis. You can visually see that both logarithmic and z-variate do a decent job of linearization. If you fit a trend line and get the r-square values, you'll see the z-variate does the best job, but only by a marginal amount. Now, one of the problems with Microsoft Excel is there is no simple way to plot data on a probability scale, but it does have a preset for plotting on a logarithmic scale. Oftentimes, for something like what is seen on screen now, we will choose logarithmic out of convenience instead of z-variate, even though z-variate has a slightly higher r-square value. Doing this makes it much easier to plot the data and is completely worth it because the change in overall result will be negligible. Next, we have another example that illustrates the importance of evaluating your data and why the interpolation method matters. 
we are given a simple numerical example where y equals x squared. If we were to interpolate linearly to find the value for y when x is 7, you would take your two closest data points on either side, in this example, x equals 5 and x equals 10, draw a straight line between them, and pull the value for x equals 7 from that line. Doing it this way, we calculate a y value of 55 as shown on the left. If we were to do a logarithmic transformation and do the same thing as shown on the right, we get a y value of 49. It's essentially the same formula as that on the left, but we're taking the log of the x values and then taking the anti-log, or 10 raised to the power of what we just calculated, to transform it back. Comparing the two methods, linear interpolation resulted in an error of 12%, and logarithmic interpolation resulted in an error of 0%. The point is that the method of interpolation can matter quite a bit. One of the tools that we are going to use today and that is embedded in many of the RMC spreadsheet tools is the interpolation macro. The macro contains various user-defined functions that can transform the data and interpolate for us. Functions are available for 1D and 2D situations. For the 1D interpolation, there are eight different functions available for the different scenarios you might run into. The syntax for the formula is shown here at the bottom. You would type in the function you want to use, and then within the parentheses, you would input or select the cell for the X value of interest, then cells of the X array, and the cells for the Y array of the data from which you are interpolating. The last two inputs, order and extrapolation, are optional and will be covered a couple slides from now. Functions have also been developed for 2D situations that allow the user to specify the transformations for X, Y, and Z. The transformation options are LIN or LIN for linear, LOG or LOG for logarithmic, and Z for Z variate. For example, if we wanted a function to interpolate linearly for X and Y and logarithmically for Z, the function would then be by LIN LIN LOG INT. If we wanted a function to be log for all three variables, the function would be by log 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 int. The lone exception is when we want a straight linear interpolation for all variables. In this instance, the formula would simply be by lin int. The syntax for these functions is similar to what we discussed for the 1D functions, but with some more inputs. The first two inputs are the X and Y values of interest, which are then followed by the X array, the Y array, and the Z array of the data from which we want to interpolate. Next, we have the optional inputs for the order, ascending or descending, of the X data and the Y data, and then whether or not we want to extrapolate for X's and Y's that fall outside of our data ranges. If your data is in ascending order, you can either set the order input equal to 1 or leave it blank. If your data is in descending order, you will need to set the order input equal to negative 1, else the function will return an error. For extrapolation, no extrapolation will occur if the input is set to 0. Should the value that you are interpolating for fall outside of your data array, the function will return either the first or last value within the data array, depending on which side of the data your interpolation value falls. If the extrapolation input is set equal to 1, the extrapolation will be performed using either the first two points or the last two points of the data arrays. For those not familiar with how to add a macro into Excel, you have two options. Using your tool ribbon, you can click on Developer and then Visual Basic. If Developer isn't listed in the ribbon, click File, then Options, then Customize Ribbon. You can then click a checkbox to activate the Developer tab. Option two is to right-click one of your worksheet tabs and choose View Code. Once in VBA, click on File and choose Import File. Select your macro file from the Explorer window and click Open. Once you've done that, the macro will be added under Modules. You can then close VBA and the macro will be available in your spreadsheet. 
Now that we've covered everything you need to know about the macro, let's look at a couple examples. In this first example, we have a system response relationship and we want to interpolate to calculate the SRP for the peak stages shown using linear for X and log for Y. The last two stages are the same, but for the last one, we want to extrapolate. So because we want linear for X and log for Y, the function will be lin log int. The first input is the X value or peak stage of interest. We follow that up with the X array shown in the red box and the Y array in the blue box. The X data is ascending, so we will input a one for the order. For the last input, we will put a zero for the first two cells to do the calculation without extrapolation and a one for the input in the last cell for extrapolation. For a peak stage at elevation 265, which falls outside the data on the left, choosing without extrapolation returns the last Y value in the data set, 2.12 times 10 to the minus two. When extrapolation is selected, it uses the last two points to project for the higher stage, resulting in a system response probability that is a little bit higher. This next example is for 2D interpolation. We want to interpolate the hydraulic shear stress for a given crack width and headwater level and are told to use linear for X and Y and Z variate for Z. So our function will be by lin lin Z int. The first input is the crack width, which is the X value. The second is the headwater, which is the Y value. These are followed up with the X array in blue, the Y array in red, and the Z array in purple. X and Y are both in ascending order, so we punch in ones for the next two inputs. In this example, whether you allow extrapolation or not, you will get the same answer. Here, extrapolation was not allowed for X or Y, so zeros were used for the last two inputs. As we have already discussed, if extrapolation is allowed the slope between the two values at the starting boundary or ending boundary is used to extend the data. If extrapolation is not allowed and the input value is beyond the assigned range, the closest boundary value will then be used. With these two options in mind, the natural question becomes, should extrapolation be allowed? Consider the following. We have a system response that is initially defined by five data points. If we are using our interpolation function and do not allow extrapolation, the SRP will be set to the system response probability of the first point for all stages less than the first point. The same thing happens at the other end of the curve where the SRP for stages greater than that of the fifth point is set equal to the system response probability of the fifth point. If we allow extrapolation, the curve gets extended through the last two points at either end of the curve and we will get the red points. If instead we were to elicit system response probabilities for the full range of loading, which is defined to be the width of this box, we might have ended up with something like the black points at the ends. At the upper end, we would have overestimated if we had extrapolated, but underestimated if we had held the probability constant. At the lower end, both options would have overestimated the system response probability. The moral of the story and the point of that last example is to show that we want to avoid extrapolation when possible. We do not want to unknowingly lose perspective, nor do we want to increase the potential for unexpected results. In the previous example, although no was selected, a form of extrapolation was still performed to obtain SRP values because the full range of loading was not specified. It's always good practice to evaluate the system response and consequences for the full range of loading to facilitate consistency and checking. Also, if there is a threshold elevation for a failure mode to initiate, then define the range over which the system response probability equals zero so that it is clear what values are being used over the full range. This brings us to the first exercise for session two. 
In this exercise, you are asked to use the interpolation macro to fill out the yellow cells in the following tables. For 2.1a, you are asked to calculate y for the given values of x using the specified interpolation routines. So we're going to do the same thing three times, but with different transformations, linear, logarithmic, and z variant. For 2.1b, you are asked to interpolate from the table above for the given xy pairs using a log transformation for both x and y and linear for z. Please pause the video and take a moment to work through the exercise. When you are finished, press play for the solution. The first column in the exercise asks us to do a straight linear interpolation. To do this, the function we need is linint. The first input for the function is our x value of interest, which is the 1.26 in cell E7. Next, we input the x array, shown in the red box, cells B5 through B9, followed by the y array, cells C5 through C9, shown in the purple box. Because the data is in ascending order, we will input a 1 for the order, which is our next input, and for the last input we will put 0 to disallow extrapolation. Dollar signs were used to lock the rows and columns of the x and y arrays. This will allow us to drag the formula down to populate the next two rows without those arrays changing. So the only thing changing in the formula is the x value of interest. In the second row, it will be E8 in the formula, and in the third row, it will be E9. After dragging the formula down, here are the results for the first column. For the second and third columns, the transformation for the y value changes, but that's it. This means that we need to use different functions, but the inputs into the function will be the same as those for the first function that we just showed for linear interpolation. In the second column, we are asked to do a logarithmic transformation for the y variable. The function we need now becomes lin log int, linear or lin for x and logarithmic or log for y. The inputs for the function are exactly the same as what we used for the first part. The first input is the x value of interest, followed by the x array, then the y array, a one for the order, and a zero to disallow extrapolation. Lock the rows and columns using dollar signs for the X array and Y array like we did before, and we're all set. Drag the formula down and you get the values shown here for Y. For the last column, we are asked to do a Z variate transformation for Y. The inputs will all be the same again, but the function will change to lin Z int, linear or lin for X, and Z variate or Z for Y. Here's the function, lin z int. Input the x value, the x array, the y array, one for the order, and zero to disallow extrapolation. Add your dollar signs to lock the rows and columns for the x and y arrays. Next, we drag the formula down to populate the rest of the table, and the completed table should look like this. For the second part of the exercise, the z value is a function of two variables, variables x and y. We are asked to interpolate to find z for the given xy pairs. We are also asked to do a log transformation for both x and y when we interpolate. The 2D interpolation function needed will be by log log lin int, log for x, log for y, and linear for z. The first input will be the x value from cell B26. The second input will be the y value from C26, followed by the x array, the y array, and the z array. The x array are the purple shaded cells that range from B15 to B19. The x array are the green cells from C14 across through F14, and the z array extends from C15 to F19 in the fuchsia box. Dollar signs were added to lock the rows and columns for the arrays because the arrays do not change, only the x's and y's for which we are interpolating. To finish out the inputs, we need the x order, the y order, and then x extrapolation and y extrapolation. 
Both the X and Y arrays are in ascending order, so the inputs will be ones for both. The instructions tell us not to allow extrapolation, so the next two inputs will both be zero. Drag the formula down to complete the table, and that completes the exercise. Before I turn it back over to Damon, let's go back to exercise 2.1a for a second. We completed the interpolation three different ways using three different transformations for y, but which method is most appropriate? If we plot out the results, plot some trend lines, and look at the computed r squared values, we can see that the z-variate transformation results in something closest to a straight line and, in this instance, would be the best choice. That covers interpolation and extrapolation. Damon will now take you through the different types of risk before getting to all the different risk calculations. Thanks, Adam. Let's first define the types of risk we will consider. We saw this slide back in session one. This figure shown is embedded in the periodic assessment and facilitators training presentations, and it is also in our dam safety and levy safety policy documents. It shows that risk is a function of the hazard, the performance, and the consequences. There are three different types of risk we will consider, incremental risk, non-breach risk, and residual risk. Incremental risk is the same as the infrastructure risk and can be the result of breach prior to overtopping, a component malfunction, misoperation, or overtopping with breach. This is the risk associated with the dam or levy and its components not performing as intended. Even when a dam or levy performs as intended, there is still some risk of inundation. This is referred to as the non-breach risk. For dams, this is typically associated with releases through the spillway, whereas for levies, it is typically associated with overtopping without breach. But we also consider overtopping without breach for dams as well. The sum of the incremental risk and the non-breach risk is our third type, residual risk. Residual risk is also known as the flood risk and refers to the total risk of inundation within the floodplain and for dams includes the reservoir area. While we calculate and discuss all three with decision makers, the Dam Safety Action Classification or DSAC and the Levy Safety Action Classification or LSAC, which are used to prioritize the inventory, are informed only by the incremental risk, the risk associated with the structure. The incremental risk is the risk that exists due to the presence of the dam or levy. The risk can either be associated with life loss or economic loss. It is calculated by taking the product of the hazard, the performance, and the incremental consequences, and then summing them up for all loading conditions. We're taking the probability of loading and multiplying it by the conditional probability of failure or system response, which is the probability of failure given the same flood or earthquake considered in the first term. The product of these first two terms is the annual probability of failure or APF. To get the risk, we then multiply by the associated incremental consequences of failure. Incremental consequences are equal to the difference between the consequences associated with a breach, component malfunction, or improper operation and those without. For the incremental risk, we are only considering the increase in consequences to calculate the risk associated with the dam or levy not performing as intended. Non-breach risk is the risk associated with intended dam operation or overtopping without breach. Although the dam or levy may function as intended, the population in the reservoir area and downstream of a dam or in the levied area are at risk due to non-breach flooding. Because we are considering the intended operation, there is no term for dam or levy performance. We are assuming that it performs as intended, so that term becomes one. This makes the non-breach risk a function of the loading and the non-breach consequences. We'll multiply those two terms together and then sum them up over all loading intervals to get the non-breach risk. To distinguish the non-breach average annual life loss and the average annual economic cost from that of the incremental, we'll use the subscript NB at the end of each term. Lastly, the residual risk is the risk of inundation at any time. Inundation can occur whether the dam or levy performs as intended or not. So the residual risk is equal to the sum of the incremental risk and the non-breach risk. 
From here, I'm going to be stepping through several calculations. There's a tab on the Module 2 Exercises and Homework Spreadsheet titled Presentation Example that can be used as a companion to this presentation. It is recommended that you use this spreadsheet to follow along with the examples and practice doing the calculations with me as I demonstrate them. There's also a tab titled Example Solutions that is set up the same way but with the calculations filled in for you to review if you happen to get stuck. The yellow cells are the calculations that I'm showing on the screen, and there are also green cells which are calculations that are not shown in the slides. These calculations are the same as what was covered in the presentation, but with different data. Risk calculations are learned by doing, so I highly recommend that you follow along. We just covered this, but here is the incremental risk equation one more time. We're going to start with the calculation for the annual probability of failure, or APF, which is the product of the loading and the system response. Here are the steps for calculating the annual probability of failure for a single failure mode. We'll start by discretizing the loading frequency into intervals. We will calculate the probability of each loading interval, and we will then multiply the system response at the midpoint of each loading interval by its corresponding loading interval probability. Lastly, we'll sum the result for all the load intervals, which will give us the annual probability of failure. Discretizing is just a fancy word for splitting or partitioning. When we split up the loading frequency into intervals, we want these intervals to encompass the full range of loading. These load intervals do not need to be even, but that is typically where we start. RMCQRA calcs by default will split things up into 50 even intervals, but allows you to adjust them as you see fit. RMC total risk does essentially the same thing, but will allow you to increase the number of intervals. When the system response probabilities or consequences are sensitive to small changes in loading, smaller intervals around those critical loads will provide better precision and yield more accurate results. Your other option would be to increase the overall number of partitions, which will lead to smaller intervals and better resolution. Because we are working with annual exceedance probabilities, the probability that a given load will be met or exceeded each year the probability of being within a given loading interval is going to be equal to the difference in the exceedance probabilities of the loads that define the interval. We should include both non-exceedance and exceedance within our intervals. In the stage frequency curve, the first peak stage of the curve will have an exceedance probability that is close to 1, but less than 1. From session one of the course, we learned that the sum of the probabilities originating from a single chance node must be collectively exhaustive and summed to one. To satisfy this rule, we need to add in the small probability of having a peak stage less than the first stage of the curve. This is the non-exceedance probability. In the plot on the screen, the first stage of the curve has an annual exceedance probability of 0.99, which means there's a 99% chance that the stage will be exceeded each year. It also means there's a 1% chance that it will not be exceeded. To account for this 1% and to make everything sum up to 1 and satisfy our event tree rules, we're going to add this non-exceedance probability to the probability we calculate for our first stage interval. A couple things on partitioning. The partitions do not have to match the loading values that are given. In this example, the black points here define the stage frequency curve but we can pick our intervals between those points and simply interpolate to get the annual exceedance probability for the stage that we have selected to define the interval. Also, to reiterate what I covered on the previous slide, because the probabilities given for each stage are exceedance probabilities, we'll need to subtract the probabilities of the stages that define the interval to calculate the probability of having a peak stage that falls within that interval. In the example, stage 1 is exceeded 99% of the time, and stage 2 is exceeded 90% of the time. Therefore, the probability that a peak stage falls between stage 1 and stage 2 is equal to 9% each year, or 99% minus 90%. The table in this slide illustrates the discretization process and how to calculate the probability for each partition or interval. The table shows how non-exceedance and exceedance probabilities are accounted for. The non-exceedance probability, as we just discussed, is added to the probability of the first interval. 
The exceedance probability is accounted for in the last interval and is simply the probability of exceeding the last load used to define our loading curve. Loading may be bounded by a state variable like stage, but unbounded by probability. For example, if we bound a stage frequency curve at the probable maximum flood, the stage frequency curve would go horizontal upon reaching the PMF and stay that way forever, because a zero cannot be plotted on a probability scale. Essentially, we'd be limiting the load range that we are considering so that the last interval, interval n, would be removed from the calculations because we are saying that we cannot exceed that stage. The formulas for discretizing into even intervals are provided at the bottom of the slide. The default for tools like RMC QRA calcs and RMC total risk is to use even intervals, but like I said earlier in this presentation, if you're gonna use even intervals, you need to make sure you use enough of them to account for inflection points in the loading, the system response, and the consequences. Also, when we say even intervals, we mean all but one even intervals because that last interval will be for the exceedance probability. So for n equals 10, we will end up with 10 total intervals, nine that are evenly spaced, and then one interval for the exceedance. Here is where you will want to start using the session two example spreadsheet that I mentioned at the beginning to help you follow along. We are given a stage frequency curve with the black diamonds in the plot corresponding to the stage annual exceedance probability or AEP that are shown in the table. We're gonna discretize into even intervals. The red triangles are the stages that split the curve into 10 even partitions. For a given interval, the probability of reaching a peak stage within that interval is equal to the AEP of the interval's lowest stage minus the AEP of the interval's highest stage. So for the second interval between peak stages A1 and A2, the probability of that interval will be equal to the AEP of A1 minus the AEP of A2. You can see here that the non-exceedance probability, one minus the AEP of the first stage is at the bottom of the chart and this should be added to the first interval. Here are the interpolated annual exceedance probabilities for the stages that define our partitions. The loading probability for each interval is calculated by taking the annual exceedance probability of the lower stage minus the annual exceedance probability of the highest stage. The loading probabilities are the same ones shown in red on the prior slide that we interpolated from the stage frequency curve. The non-exceedance is added into the first partition, and if everything is done correctly, these probabilities will all sum to one. When we are calculating risk, we are essentially calculating the area under a consequence frequency curve that is derived from the loading, the system response probabilities, and the consequences using the trapezoidal rule. The discretization or partitioning gives us the trapezoids. This is also essentially what we're doing with event tree calculations. We develop a branch for every loading partition, assign the system response probability and life loss that best represents the interval, and then the frequency or the Y value of the trapezoid will be the product of the loading times the system response, and the X value will be the change in the consequences. We can then multiply X and Y for each trapezoid to get each area, and then sum them up to get a good approximation of the area under the curve. With regards to the number of intervals that we need, it's good practice to use at least 50 intervals, but this is arbitrary. The key is to have enough intervals, evenly spaced or not, to adequately account for the inflection points in the input curves. This brings us to our second exercise of the session, discretization. For this exercise, you are given a stage frequency relationship and asked to discretize into 10 even intervals and then to calculate the loading probability for each interval. The instructions also say to include non-exceedance. Please pause the video and complete the exercise, then resume when you are finished.
To linear discretize into even intervals, we're going to use the equation from an earlier slide, which I have repeated at the bottom of this slide. n is set equal to 10 and is the number of intervals. For the upper stage of the first interval, we're going to take the lower stage in cell E10, elevation 725.8, and add the difference of our greatest peak stage, elevation 773.4, and our lowest peak stage, elevation 725.8, all divided by n minus 1, which for an n of 10 equals 9. We'll use the dollar signs to lock the row and column of these cells in the numerator because they are constants and will stay the same for the subsequent intervals. For the next interval, we will pick up where the other interval left off. So we will set cell E11 equal to the elevation we just calculated in cell F10. From there, we can drag the formulas down in columns E and F to complete these columns of the table. Now that we have discretized the full range of loading into 10 intervals, let's calculate the loading probability of each interval. We are going to interpolate using the Excel interpolation macro discussed at the beginning of this presentation. Because stage frequency is plotted on a probability scale, we will use z-varied interpolation. In the first interval, because we are including non-exceedance, the first term is 1, and we subtract from it the AEP of the upper interval. The equation I used here is the same as that shown to the right, but with the terms reduced. It is equal to the AEP of the lower stage minus the AEP of the upper stage plus the non-exceedance, which equals 1 minus the AEP of the lower stage. The probability of the first loading interval is going to be 4.88 times 10 to the minus 1. For the other intervals, the procedure is similar. Use z-variate interpolation to calculate the AEP for stage 1, interpolate again to calculate the AEP for stage 2, and then subtract it from the stage 1 AEP. Remember to use the dollar signs for the peak stage array and the AEP array and then you can drag that formula down and complete all but the last cell of the table. Dragging the formula down, we get these probabilities. The final interval is our exceedance probability, which in this case is the probability of having a stage greater than elevation 773.4. You can interpolate like I've done here or the easiest thing would be to just to set the probability equal to the AEP for elevation 773.4 directly from the table, which is an AEP of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. So that completes our table. As a check, it is always a good idea to make sure these loading probabilities all sum to 1. And here they do, so we know that we are in good shape. Now we'll move into potential failure modes and their associated system response probabilities. With the stage frequency curve discretized and probabilities calculated for each interval, the next step is to calculate the system response probabilities for each interval. When we develop our system response curve, we need to evaluate enough stages to cover the full range of loading. Possible inflection points can be related to performance observations, changes in geometry or geology, and hydraulic conditions like top evacuative storage, above which tailwater may increase. Also, it's always good to define your system response probabilities at least up to top of dam, not just the PMF, because as data and methodology change and improve, that PMF elevation might also change. The system response probabilities, at least for this failure mode, are estimated as a function of peak stage. For calculating the APF, we will need the system response probabilities at the midpoint of each of the loading intervals that we created earlier. For each interval or loading range, we're going to take the midpoint, which is the average stage for that interval, and then we're going to interpolate from the system response curve to get the probabilities. Here, a logarithmic transformation was used when interpolating to get the system response probabilities. Z-variate would have been marginally better at linearization, but not by enough to make a meaningful difference. 
So with this in mind, we use logarithmic interpolation because it's much easier to plot in Excel. Just to reiterate, we take the midpoint stage of each loading range, then interpolate to find the system response probability for that midpoint stage. Now that we have loading probabilities and system response probabilities for each loading interval, we can calculate the APF. This is done by multiplying the loading probability by the system response probability in each loading range, then summing those products together. In this example, the annual probability of failure turns out to be 5.07 times 10 to the minus 4. Calculating the annual probability of failure was the first part, but it's not risk until we consider consequences. Next, we will calculate the average annual life loss and the average incremental life loss. To do this, we start with the calculation for incremental life loss, and like the system response probabilities, we will do this for the midpoint of each loading interval. It will be done for each exposure scenario as well. Exposure is the fraction of a period of time for which a life loss estimate applies. Typically, we only consider day and night for exposure, but as discussed in session one, other scenarios can be considered as well and should be considered when they might impact the risk estimate. To calculate the average annual life loss, we're going to multiply the annual probability of failure by the exposure and incremental life loss, then sum the results to obtain the average annual life loss. After we calculate the average annual life loss, we will divide that value by the total annual probability of failure to calculate n bar the average incremental life loss. N-bar is the average number of fatalities that is expected should the dam or levy fail, considering all possible loading and exposure scenarios. Continuing with the example that we've been working through, we will start with the breach life loss table shown on the left. Like we did for the system response, we are going to interpolate to find the breach life loss for the midpoint stage of each loading range. We will do this for both the day and night exposure scenarios, and we will use linear interpolation. For the last interval, where we are considering exceedance, these are stages greater than elevation 911.8, it's really not the midpoint, but we will interpolate and use the breach life loss for elevation 911.8. Next, we will repeat the exact same procedure for the non-breach life loss. We will interpolate to find the non-breach life loss for each exposure at the midpoint of each loading range. The incremental life loss is the difference between the breach life loss and the non-breach life loss. For each exposure scenario of each loading interval, subtract the non-breach life loss from the breach life loss to get the incremental life loss. For the second to last interval, elevation 901.3 to elevation 911.8, the math is shown. For the day exposure, the incremental life loss is equal to 495 minus 18, which equals 477 as shown in red. And for the night exposure, which is shown in green, it's 438 minus 21, which gives us 417. Now that we have the incremental life loss, the last thing we need to calculate the average annual life loss, or AALL, is the exposure. We are told to assume a 10-hour workday, so we will simply divide those 10 hours by the number of hours in a day to get the day exposure. The night exposure will be the complement, 1 minus 0.417, which equals 0.583. For the night exposure, you could have also taken the 14 remaining hours and simply divided by 24, which also equals 0.583. Now that we have everything we need, we are ready to calculate the average annual life loss. To do this, at each loading interval, we multiply the day exposure by the day incremental life loss and add that to the product of the night exposure and the night incremental life loss. We then multiply that sum by the APF. Finally, we sum the average annual life loss calculated for each interval and get a total average annual life loss of 1.29 times 10 to the minus 2 lives per year. We will take the average annual life loss that we just calculated and divide it by the annual probability of failure to get n bar, the average incremental life loss. The average annual life loss is 1.29 times 10 to the minus 2 We'll divide that by the annual probability of failure, which is 5.07 times 10 to the minus 4, and that gives us an end bar, which is equal to 25 lives per failure.
That brings us to exercise number three for this session, where you're going to practice calculating the annual probability of failure, the average annual life loss, and the average incremental life loss. In the exercise, you are given the system response, which you're going to interpolate from using semi-logarithmic interpolation. You're also given the non-breach life loss and the breach life loss. We are going to use the same stage frequency curve and loading intervals from the previous exercise, so that part of the table is already populated for you. Your task is to calculate the annual probability of failure, the average annual life loss, and the average incremental life loss. Please pause the video and take all the time you need to work through things and then restart the video once you've completed the exercise. The first step is to interpolate to calculate the system response probability for the midpoint of each loading interval. To get the midpoint, we will take the average of the lower and upper stage that define the interval. We are instructed to use semi-log interpolation with linear for stage and logarithmic transformation for the system response, so we will use the lin log int function from our Excel macro. The first input is the midpoint of the loading range, which is equal to the average of the two stages. Next is the X array, which is the peak stage from our system response table. And then the Y array is the system response probabilities from that same table. The data is in ascending order, so the input for order will be one, and we do not want to extrapolate, so the input for extrapolation will be zero. Use dollar signs to lock the row and columns for the X array and the Y array, so we can drag the formulas down to finish out the column. When we do that, we get these values for the system response probabilities. Next, we will multiply the loading probability by the system response probability. So that's D32 times cell E32. And then we can drag that formula all the way down to get the APF for each interval. The exercise instructions tell us to assume a 10 hour workday. So our day exposure will be 10 divided by 24, the number of hours in a day. Likewise, for the night exposure, it'll be 14 divided by 24, or you could have taken one minus the day exposure. We get a day exposure of 0.417 and a night exposure of 0.583. The exposure weightings will be the same for all intervals, so we can drag the formulas for those cells down to the bottom of the table. Next, we need to calculate our incremental life loss for the midpoint of each loading interval. The incremental life loss is equal to the breach life loss minus the non-breach life loss, and we will do this for each exposure using linear interpolation. Starting with the day life loss, the first part of the formula is for the daytime breach life loss. The average of cells B32 and C32 are the midpoint of the interval, and our X and Y arrays come from the breach life loss table as shown. From that, we subtract the non-breach life loss. The non-breach formula is pretty much the same, but with the X and Y arrays coming from the non-breach life loss table. Dollar signs were used to lock the rows and columns of the X and Y arrays on both sides of the equation, so we can later drag and drop the formulas down to fill out the table. For the first interval, the daytime incremental life loss should come out to be 11. Next, we will repeat the step we just did, but for the night exposure. The only part of the formula that changes from before is the Y array. The column changes from G and C for breach and non-breach over to H and D to reference the night data instead of the day. The quickest way to do this is to copy and paste the equation we had from the day before, then click in the formula bar, click the edge of each rectangle at the top, and drag that rectangle over from the day column to the night column. For the first interval, the nighttime incremental life loss is 19. Then we can drag those formulas down to compute the incremental life loss for the rest of the intervals. To 
calculate the average annual life loss at each interval. We multiply the day exposure by the day life loss and multiply the night exposure by the night life loss and then sum those together. That sum gets multiplied by the APF. We can then drag the formula down to complete the upper table. With a little more work, we will have the total APF, the total AALL, and the N bar. So then we sum the APFs over each interval to get the total APF. And then sum the average annual life losses for each interval to get the total average annual life loss. Then divide the total average annual life loss by the total annual probability of failure to get N bar. When all is said and done, we calculate the APF to be 1.43 times 10 to the minus 6, the AALL to be 1.08 times 10 to the minus 4, and N bar to be 75. Similar to how we calculated the AALL and N bar, we can calculate the average annual economic cost, AAEC, and the average incremental economic cost, dollar bar. The process and the equations are the same, but we do these calculations with dollars now instead of life loss. Seismic failure modes get a little more complicated because the system response becomes a function of both earthquake and stage, but it generally follows the same process. Here's how it would look in an inventory format where we have the branches for the different PGA intervals, and then for each of those ground motions, we have a full set of intervals for the flood duration, which leads into the failure branches. The APF is still equal to the loading probability times the system response, and the average annual life loss is still equal to the APF times the exposure weighted consequences. Note that for pool, we are using the stage duration curve, not the stage frequency curve. We do this because we want to know what fraction of time in a year the reservoir exceeds a specific stage. We can then multiply that by the annual probability of a specific earthquake to get the combined and coincident probability. The RMC joint loading probability toolbox can be used to develop the joint loading matrix for seismic failure modes. In the toolbox, on the earthquake hazard worksheet, the site coordinates and the source for the seismic hazard data are input. Then the seismic hazard data is input. In the flood hazard worksheet, the stage duration relationship is input. First, the elevation datum is selected, followed by the method for extrapolating the stage duration relationship and the required inputs. When period of record or detail level are selected, the stage duration used will be as input by the user. If screening level is selected, the user will be prompted for a set of inputs and the spreadsheet will extrapolate the stage duration relationship to the upper bound peak reservoir stage defined. For this method, only the period of record is input in the yellow cells at the bottom of the sheet. The spreadsheet will automatically add the upper bound stage input from the prior step. Next, the exposure and life loss consequence estimates can be input, which will be used in a later step to calculate the average annual incremental life loss. In the risk screening worksheet, the user will define the headwater and peak ground acceleration partitions to evaluate. Earthquake and flood thresholds can be input at the top of the sheet. If these thresholds are left blank, the spreadsheet will return a true joint loading probability matrix. When defined, the spreadsheet assumes failure will not occur for earthquakes and stages less than the defined thresholds. The spreadsheet will also calculate an annual probability of failure, assuming certain failure, a system response equal to one, above these thresholds. This is useful information when screening potential failure modes. When the calculated annual probability of failure is very low, the failure mode can likely be excluded without additional analysis. Also in the risk screening worksheet, the average annual incremental life loss is calculated using the life loss consequences and the earthquake and flood threshold inputs.
Instead of being able to do the calculations one column at a time, each column becomes a table for a seismic failure mode. Two-way interpolation for the system response probabilities will be required. Past that, all the calculations are the same, there's just a lot more of them. For exercise 2.4, we are going to calculate the joint loading probabilities and the annual probability of failure for a seismic failure mode. First, we are asked to use the RMC joint loading probability toolbox to create the joint loading matrix. You are given the seismic hazard and stage duration relationships. For the stage duration, the relationship has already been extrapolated beyond the period of record, so detailed level should be selected in the flood hazard worksheet. The partitions to use in the toolbox are provided, and we are told to leave the earthquake and flood thresholds blank. Once complete, we then copy the joint loading matrix from the toolbox and paste it into the exercise spreadsheet. We are then asked to calculate the annual probability of failure using the joint loading matrix and the system response probabilities provided in the table. In this exercise, we are not calculating the average annual life loss, so you will not need to use the consequence worksheet of the toolbox. Please pause this video now and work through the exercise. When you are finished, press play to resume. To start, we are going to copy the earthquake hazard and paste it under step 3 in the earthquake hazard worksheet of the toolbox. Next, we will copy the stage duration relationship and paste it into the flood hazard worksheet of the toolbox. Detailed level is selected for the method for extrapolating the stage duration relationship. Next, we take the peak ground acceleration partitions and the stage partitions in the green cells and input them into the toolbox. The earthquake and flood thresholds are left blank to return a true joint loading matrix. This completes the joint loading matrix, so we will copy the matrix and paste it into the yellow cells of the exercise spreadsheet. Next, we calculate the APF for each joint loading combination. The APF will be equal to the joint loading probability multiplied by the system response. We take the first joint loading probability from cell D48 and multiply that by the system response for that joint partition. To get the system response, two-way interpolation is required. The directions say to use linear interpolation, so the function is by lin int, and the formula is shown in the formula bar at the top of the screen. The first input x is the midpoint, or average PGA for the partition, followed by the average stage for the partition y, followed by the x array, which is the PGAs from the system response table, and the y array, which is the stage from the system response table. Next is the z array, which is the system response probabilities. We want to lock the columns of the X input, the rows for the Y input, and both the columns and rows for the arrays so that we can drag the formulas. Dragging the formula over and down completes the table. To calculate the annual probability of failure, we sum all the values in the yellow cells of the table. and the APF is calculated to be 7.12 times 10 to the minus seven. All the examples covered up to this point have been for a single failure mode. What do we do when we have multiple failure modes? In module one, we discuss combining failure modes, and this is something that is worth reiterating here so that we can be sure that we are combining the failure mode risk estimates in a way that is technically correct. We do not want to artificially inflate the risk by how we combine failure modes, and we need to be aware of the breach characteristics of each failure mode. There are several options available for combining risk. 
The joint risk model is the most accurate, but it's also the most computationally intensive. For the common cause adjustment, intersection events are weighted and distributed by potential failure mode. In the competing risk model, it is assumed that the first failure precludes additional failures or additional consequences. And in the exclusive risk model, dependence among potential failure modes is assumed to be negligible with respect to both probability and consequences, such that the estimates can be summed. As discussed in Module 1, which model to use depends on the tools available and the accuracy required. Common cause adjustment has been the most frequently used risk model for dam safety risk assessments. Not discussed in Module 1 is what to do when the same failure mechanism is evaluated multiple ways. For a given failure mechanism, if the embankment profile is divided into segments or different cross sections for evaluation due to physical differences in geology, geometry, treatment, or whatever, only the location with the maximum system response probability should be included at a given loading partition. The other locations at that loading partition get assigned a probability of zero. A word of caution when working on a levee though. For a levee, breach in one location does not necessarily preclude breach in another like it often does for a dam. You will likely need to consider the possibility of multiple segments failing at the same time, possibly by the same mechanism, and possibly with overlapping consequences. We will also take the maximum probability at each loading partition when we have multiple failure paths in the same area for the same mechanism. I'll show an example of the different types of flow paths on the next slide. In both instances described here, the composite system response relationship for the failure mechanism would then be combined with the project's other system response curves per the selected risk model. Here is a figure showing some examples of cross sections where different flow paths would need to be evaluated for the same cross section. You will want to consider flow paths above and below the core, above and below incline drains and filters, and above and below stability berms. To combine the risk estimates for the different flow paths of a cross section, we will take the maximum system response probabilities between the flow paths for a given loading. Here we have the marginal system response probabilities for a couple potential failure modes, and we are told to perform a common cause adjustment. PFM 2A and 2B are the same failure mechanism evaluated at different locations. So prior to performing the common cause adjustment, we must first identify the maximum probability between PFM 2A and 2B at each loading partition and zero out the other probabilities. As shown, the system response for PFM 2A is highest for all stages, but the third to last and second to last partitions. The maximum system response probabilities are carried forward and the others are replaced with zeros. Next, we perform the common cause adjustment using the procedure covered in module one. For dams, performing the adjustment by stage is typically okay. Again, you need to be careful with levees. For levees, annual exceedance probability typically should be used because the stage varies along the length of the levee. The same flood will result in different stages at different places along the levee. Coastal levees are different because the loading is typically a composite, such that a given AEP stage at one location is not the same event as the AEP stage at a different location. To then calculate the total project risk, we will need to complete the event tree math and sum the failure end nodes to calculate the total APF using the adjusted system response probabilities we just calculated. We will multiply the APF by N for each loading interval or event tree branch at each failure mode and then sum them all up to calculate the average annual life loss. We will divide the average annual life loss by the APF to get N bar. Lastly, we will do the same thing for the economic risk and multiply the APF by the dollar amount for each loading interval or event tree branch of each failure mode and then sum them up to calculate the average annual economic cost. In the example we just did, after the adjustment, 
The total project APF will be a simple sum of the APF calculated for each failure mode, which then gets split and weighted by exposure for consequence estimation purposes. But it will not always be this simple. If you have a proceeding node like gate inoperability or debris blockage, that will need to be handled in the project event tree calculations. Here, for this example, the contribution of the total from PFM1 during the day will be equal to the loading probability times the probability of gate inoperability times the system response for PFM1 times the exposure. Having completed the incremental risk calculations, there are a variety of ways we can present the results. There's the little FN plot, risk profile plots, which plot how the risk changes with an increase in loading, there's the big FN plot, an F dollar plot, and the individual risk plot. Starting with the little FN plot, this is the most used and one of the easier portrayals to understand. It is one of the primary considerations used when assigning dam and levee safety action classifications. The X axis is the average incremental life loss, N bar, and the Y axis is the annual probability of failure. The diagonal lines, which are the product of the APF and N bar, show the average annual life loss. On this plot, we will plot the risk of each potential failure mode without adjustment, and then the total project risk. The reason we adjust failure modes is to avoid errors such as double counting when we combine them, so the adjustment only impacts the total project risk. In this example, the highest risk failure mode is PFM2B, even though it has the lowest APF of the plotted failure modes. The risk is represented by the diagonal lines as it is the combination of both probability and consequences. The Corps of Engineers Average Annual Life Loss Guideline is shown as the black dash diagonal line, and it applies to both dams and levees. Risks are unacceptable when the average annual life loss is greater than or equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 3, except in extraordinary circumstances. Risks that plot in the bottom right-hand portion of the plot, with an annual probability of failure less than 10 to the minus 6, and life loss greater than 1,000, are referred to as low probability, high consequence events. Estimated risks that plot within this region deserve special scrutiny during the decision-making process, because of the magnitude of the expected consequences. More on this later. For risk profile or cumulative plots, we will calculate the cumulative APF starting with the lowest loading interval and working up towards the highest peak stage. When we finish, the APF at the last stage should be equal to the total APF of the potential failure mode. The results are plotted stepwise. The plot makes it easy to see which loading ranges contribute most significantly to the overall APF of the potential failure mode. In this example, you can see how the steps get smaller and smaller as the stage increases, illustrating that these stages are contributing less and less to the overall total risk. About 90% of the risk here is coming from stages below elevation 880, and over 70% of the risk is coming from stages below elevation 870. Technically, the spot is supposed to be plotted in a stepwise fashion, but that can be a bit of a hassle. If you have enough partitions, you can just plot the cumulative APF with the midpoint of the loading intervals. It will communicate essentially the same information, but it's much easier to create. We can create these plots for annual probability of failure, average annual life loss, and average annual economic cost. We can create them for individual failure modes, like on the previous slide, where we use the unadjusted system response, and we can create them for the total project risk, where we use the adjusted system response to get the potential failure modes contribution to the total as shown here. For each stage interval, we sum the probabilities from each failure mode to get the total for the stage, then the cumulative is equal to the total APF from that interval, plus the sum of the APFs for all lower intervals. Once complete, it will look like this with stepwise functions for the individual potential failure modes shown in red, blue, and green, along with the total shown in black.
Next, we have the big FN plot and the big F dollar plot. These are probably the least understood of all the required plots that are used. The big FN plot displays a probability distribution of incremental life loss from all failure modes and all population exposure scenarios for all inundation scenarios associated with the incremental risk. This curve is like the flood hazard curve or the seismic hazard curve, but with the axes flipped so that the probabilities are on the y-axis. You can think of this plot as a frequency curve for consequences. The big FN plot is essentially a complementary cumulative distribution function. The only difference is it shows the probability of being greater than or equal to a given life loss. This plot answers the question, what is the annual probability F of incremental life loss greater than or equal to N? To use it, pick your incremental life loss magnitude of interest. Draw a line straight up until you reach the curve, then draw a horizontal line to the y-axis to get the annual probability of having at least that number of fatalities. For this example, the estimated annual probability of 300 or more fatalities due to dam failure is about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Both the little fn plot and the big fn plot have a region in the bottom right hand corner for low probability and high consequence events. Estimated risks that plot within this region deserve special scrutiny during the decision making process because of the magnitude of the expected consequences. When estimating probabilities, there is a lower bound beyond which the reliability of the estimates becomes questionable. There is also a threshold beyond which the magnitude of the consequences necessitates extraordinary measures to control risk. Because of this, it is appropriate to treat low probability and high consequence situations with great care and closer scrutiny to ensure everything reasonable has been done to reduce risks. This region is defined by life loss, either average incremental or just incremental, that is greater than or equal to 1,000 in an annual probability less than or equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 6. A personal pet peeve of mine is when this low probability, high consequence region of the FN plot is referred to as the unicorn box. It's not clear to me why this ever became called this, because I'm under the impression that magical unicorns are good and that high consequence due to a dam or levee failure would be very bad. So please do not refer to this region as the unicorn box. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. We've had several projects plot in the low probability, high consequence region, so there's nothing mythical about it. There are a handful of steps to make the big FN plot. To start, we're going to multiply the APF calculated using the adjusted system response probability by the exposure of each partition of each potential failure mode. The table to the right is a zoomed in version of the table on the left, which was generated as part of the example we've been working through this entire session. Here we see the portion of the table for PFM1. We have the APF for each interval. We multiply that by the day exposure in the top half of the table and by the night exposure in the bottom half of the table to get our probability F. Each one of these scenarios has an associated incremental life loss. Remember the incremental n values we calculated earlier? Those are the same day and night values here that we will use to create what we will call our fn pairs, tying each probability to a life loss. We need all possible fn pairs across all exposures, partitions, and potential failure modes. Once I have all those pairs, I'm going to merge them into one big table and then sort them by the incremental life loss, n. All the pairs from all potential failure modes and exposures are in this table. When we sort them, we want to sort them high to low. From these sorted fn pairs, we will calculate the big F for each n, the cumulative probability, by summing the little f's for that n and higher n's, much like we did when developing the cumulative risk profile plots earlier. For the first partition, the little f is going to be equal to the big F, and it's equal to 7.04 times 10 to the minus 8. I add 1.36 times 10 to the minus 6, 
and get 1.43 times 10 to the minus 6 for the next interval. I add 0 to that and get 1.43 times 10 to the minus 6 again for the next one. And I'll continue that process until I reach the very bottom of the table. When finished, the cumulative probability, the big F for the lowest N, should be equal to the annual probability of failure for the project. So to reiterate, merge the FN pairs in one big list, sort high to low by N, then sum the partitions as you move down the table to calculate the cumulative probability. The last step is to plot the data stepwise. The first cumulative probability is plotted with the first two ends. The second cumulative probability is plotted with the second and third ends, and so on and so forth. Once finished, extend the rightmost end of the curve straight down to the x-axis and the leftmost end over to the y-axis. The curve extends infinitely downward and represents the maximum incremental life loss. The curve is also extended to the left because there is no discrete point for n equals zero because of the logarithmic scale. We also have a plot for the individual most at risk. The individual life risk is represented by the probability of life loss for the identifiable person or group by location that is most at risk of life loss due to a dam or a levee breach. It is influenced by a person's location, exposure, and vulnerability within a breach inundation area. The individual risk is calculated as the annual probability of failure times the likelihood of the most exposed person or group losing their life. The second term in the equation will be provided by the consequence specialist. The individual life risk limit is 1 times 10 to the minus 4. The individual risk will always be less than or equal to the annual probability of failure. So if the annual probability of failure is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4, then the individual risk will also be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4 and below the limit. Having covered incremental risk, I will cover non-breach risk next. If you remember from earlier, the equation is like the incremental risk equation, but the system response is no longer present in the equation. The non-breach risk is the risk associated with intended dam operation or overtopping without breach and is equal to the probability of the loading times the non-breach consequences summed up over the full range of loading. Next, I will run through a quick example. I've already covered how to partition hazard curves into intervals when calculating the incremental risk, and we'll do it the same way for the non-breach risk. The partitions we develop should be the same across all types of risk that we calculate. For each loading partition, we will interpolate from the non-breach life loss table to get the non-breach life loss for the midpoint of each loading partition, and we will do that for each exposure scenario being considered. Once we have done that, if we know our loading probability and the exposure, both of which we covered previously, we can calculate the average annual life loss for the non-breach the same way we did for the incremental using the equation at the top of the slide. For each interval, multiply the day exposure by the day non-breach life loss, add it to the product of the night exposure and the night non-breach life loss, then multiply by the loading probability and sum those products together to get the total non-breach average annual life loss. We can also calculate the non-breach average annual economic cost. This is done using the same steps as we did for the average annual life loss, but using dollars and cents instead of life loss. We typically present the non-breach risk on the big FN plot and the F dollar plots, and cumulatively versus the loading for average annual life loss and average annual economic cost. The non-breach risk big FN plot is constructed the same way as the incremental FN plot, but for the FN pairs, F is the loading probability multiplied by the exposure, and N is the non-breach life loss. The gray dashed line shown does not have the same meaning as the societal tolerable risk limit on the big FN plot. It is used as a reference line to allow easy comparison between the non-breach risk and the incremental life safety risk. There are no life safety risk guidelines for the non-breach risk. I find it most illustrative to plot the incremental risk 
and the non-breach risk on the same plot, along with the residual risk. I'll cover a residual risk next. Residual risk. Lastly, the residual risk is the risk of inundation at any time. Inundation can occur whether the dam or levee performs as intended or not. So the residual risk is equal to the sum of the incremental risk and the non-breach risk. Next, I'm going to go through a little bit of algebra to expand and reorder the terms that will help us when we go to plot the residual risk on the big FN plot. Splitting these terms out, the incremental risk is equal to the probability of the loading times the system response and the incremental consequences, as shown in red. And the non-breach risk is equal to the probability of the loading times the non-breach consequences. The incremental consequences are equal to the breach consequences minus the non-breach consequences, as shown in green. Expanding the terms by multiplying it all out gives me the next line. I can then factor out the probability of the loading times the non-breach consequences from the last two terms. Once I've done that, and I rearrange the terms one more time, you can see how the residual risk is equal to the APF times the breach consequences, the total breach consequences, not the incremental, plus the non-breach complement, the probability of the loading times one minus the system response times the non-breach consequences. When I go to construct the big FN plot for the residual risk, there will be a set of FN pairs for the total breach consequences, and there will be a set of pairs for the non-breach consequences. Just like the non-breach risk, we typically present residual risk on the big FN plot and F dollar plot, and cumulatively with the loading versus the average annual life loss and the average annual economic cost. Remember that I said we would have two sets of FN pairs when we develop the big FN chart. We will start with the failure or breach set. Multiply the APF and the exposure to get F and pair them with the total breach life loss to get the first set of FN pairs. Again, this is the total breach life loss, not the incremental life loss for this plot. This first set of FN pairs is shown on the table on the left. Next, we need the FN pairs for the non-breach complement. To get the non-breach complement, we will subtract the APF sum for all PFMs at a given interval, as shown in red, from the loading probability, which is shown in blue. F will be that difference multiplied by the exposure, shown in green, and that product will pair with the associated non-breach life loss to get the FN pairs for the non-breach complement. Then, once we have both sets of FN pairs, we're going to merge them together into one list and sort them from high to low for N. We will then calculate the cumulative probability the same way we did for the incremental and non-breach big FN plots. The cumulative probability must sum to 1 for the last N value for the residual risk. Lastly, we plot everything stepwise. We extend the top of the curve to the left all the way to the y-axis and extend the bottom of the curve down to the x-axis. It can be very illustrative to plot the incremental, the non-breach, and the residual risk all in the same plot to show a complete portrayal of the risk. Looking at the average annual life loss versus peak stage, you can see that the risk is driven solely by the incremental risk up until the top of active storage at elevation 885 when there is then a small increase in the residual risk compared to the incremental because of spillway releases. In this particular instance, the residual risk is dominated by the incremental risk, but that is not always the case. There are some considerations and some common issues that occur with risk calculations and portrayal. It is good practice to always plot the system response curve and to review its shape. Can inflection points be explained? Can abrupt changes be explained? Are additional points needed to provide better resolution where rapid changes may occur over a short interval? These are the kind of questions that we'll need to be able to answer. In the top left, the system response probability becomes constant with increasing stage. Maybe that's because a system response probability equal to one was reached 
or maybe because the tailwater rises and reduces the gradient such that the system response probability can no longer rise. At the bottom left is an example of a brittle system. There's a threshold stage above which performance changes dramatically for the worse. For systems like this, you need to make sure that there are sufficient points assessed to adequately define where the change occurs and to make sure that that change is not caused because too few points were evaluated. The top middle is another system response probability that abruptly increases with very little change in stage, but then this one flattens out at higher pools. In the bottom middle plot, what would cause the system response probability to decrease with an increasing stage? Tailwater may reduce the hydraulic gradient and hence the probability above a threshold stage value. But because we were dealing with peak stages, the stage would have had to pass through a lower stage that has a higher system response probability. This means that the timing is very important to consider. A system response such as this one is only possible if there's a very flashy pool with a quick rise in both pool and tailwater. If the pool rises slowly, then this curve would not be representative and instead of decreasing at the higher pools, it should become horizontal at the maximum system response. This next system response probability is impossible, and if you see something like this, you should know immediately that something went wrong. System response curves cannot cross themselves. And for this last one, it is defined by only three stages with large changes in the system response between them. The team should ask itself whether sufficient stages were evaluated to identify inflection points because the system response probability might not increase linearly between the first and second points as shown here. Next, I am going to go through a few examples of common issues and mistakes that can impact the risk estimate and where it plots. In this first example, the zero threshold elevation for an overtopping failure mode was not defined. This mistake led to an overestimation of the APF by more than two orders of magnitude. Because the zero point was not defined, when the team extrapolated, the system response for one foot of overtopping was incorrectly applied to all stages below that elevation. Remember how when extrapolation is not allowed and an input value is beyond the assigned data range, the closest boundary value is used. This is what happened here and it resulted in an overestimation of the risk. The proper way is to elicit overtopping failure modes as a function of overtopping depth instead of pool and to start at an overtopping depth of zero. In this next example, the estimated total life loss increased by over 2,500 with only a five foot difference in pool elevation. Evaluating an intermediate stage captured the inflection point associated with non-breach releases that was missed and the average annual life loss dropped by more than an order of magnitude. So, like we discussed a few slides ago for the system response, you should plot the consequences with the loading to make sure that they make sense. When there are large increases between loading increments, estimates may be needed between them to make sure the inflection points are properly defined. In this example, there were insufficient resolution in the stage partitioning. The hydraulic hazard was discretized into 50 even intervals, but a key threshold was stepped over, which resulted in an underestimation of the annual probability of failure. To remedy this issue, you can increase the resolution with smaller intervals around the critical load, or you can increase the total number of intervals, which of course will make the intervals smaller. There is no issue with the final example, but many a reviewer has been concerned about how the with intervention life loss appears to increase from what is plotted for the without intervention case. Will there really be more fatalities when we try to save the dam? If the fatalities are not increasing, then why does the plot look like this? The answer is that N bar is a weighted average. Intervention often has a higher probability of being successful at lower stages. Thus, the contribution from the higher stages to the total APF is higher for the with intervention scenario than it is for the scenario without. 
Since higher stages generally have higher life loss consequences, the average life loss, N bar, will often be a little higher. That covers risk calculations and portrayal. I'll now turn it back over to Adam Goes, who will cover risk reduction evaluation. Thanks, Damon. As Damon just mentioned, the final topic for session two is risk reduction evaluation. For modification studies and feasibility studies, the first step in evaluating risk reduction measures is to look at the potential failure mode event trees and identify where in the tree a given measure is going to reduce the risk. These measures can be structural or non-structural. Typically, structural measures will target the performance and reduce the system response, but they can also impact the flood loading or stage duration relationships. For example, if we were to make a physical modification and add an auxiliary spillway, the flood hazard would be impacted. Non-structural measures primarily target the incremental consequences, but some non-structural measures, like a change in the operation schedule, can change the flood loading or stage duration relationships. In a risk reduction evaluation, we are evaluating the change from a baseline condition. In our formulation process, this baseline condition is known as the future without action condition, or FWAC. Then you are going to consider and quantify how the risk changes with an implemented risk management plan or the future with federal action condition. To evaluate the risk reduction, we can look at the change in the risk assessment outputs of annual probability of failure, the incremental average annual life loss, and the incremental average annual economic cost. The change can be presented as a percentage by looking at the change from the original condition and dividing by the original condition. The change will typically be negative because the risk reduction measures being evaluated should hopefully reduce the risk. Because the changes in annual probability of failure, incremental average annual life loss, and incremental average annual economic cost that are associated with a measure or plan can be orders of magnitude, it is helpful to report the order of magnitude change, which can be calculated as the difference in the logarithms of the values. We will also calculate the cost to save a statistical life for each risk management plan, or RMP. Cost to save a statistical life is a measure of the cost effectiveness or efficiency of a risk management plan. The numerator is a measure of the net annual cost of the RMP, and the denominator is a measure of the life safety risk reduction. The Corps of Engineers uses this in a slightly different way than it was originally developed because we calculate it for every measure, but traditionally it is not calculated or considered until risks are first reduced to tolerable levels. In that application, it is used to determine if measures to further reduce risks below tolerable levels are justified. The first term in the equation is the annual implementation cost of the RMP. Typically, this is the construction cost of the measure annualized over the period of analysis that will be provided by the cost engineer with some input from planning. If the risk management plan were to include a reservoir restriction, the loss benefits would be included in this term. This term also includes any annualized first costs and annual operation costs associated with a non-structural risk reduction measure in the RMP, such as downstream community emergency preparedness, warning, and response measures. The second term is the change in the average annual economic cost. This is equal to the baseline average annual economic cost, which will be for the FWAC or for an intermediate staged implementation condition, minus the average annual economic cost after implementation of the risk management plan or after a subsequent staged implementation condition. The final term in the numerator is the change in operation and maintenance cost. These are the actual costs required to properly maintain the project if not constrained by funding. For the change in the O&M cost, it is not necessary to estimate the average annual equivalent O&M cost of the FWAC and RMP separately because the change due to the RMP is what is important. There are a couple examples listed here. When the change is less than zero, there is an increase in the annual O&M cost. This can occur, for example, when the RMP includes the addition of a tow drain and relief well system 
because that system will need to be inspected and cleaned periodically. Or perhaps new piezometers were installed that need to be read. When the change is greater than zero, the reduction in the annual O&M cost has decreased. This could be for a cutoff wall that replaces the need for a tow drain system, such that the periodic inspection, cleaning, and repair of that system that used to occur is no longer needed. The denominator of the CSSL calculation contains the change in the incremental life safety risk. In most cases, we will be comparing a risk management plan back to the future without action condition, but comparisons can also be made to an intermediate stage. This has not been done very often, but an example of an intermediate staged implementation condition would be if a dam foundation were to be grouted in preparation for a cutoff wall, but then based on the information obtained and the risk reduction achieved by the grouting, decide later if the cutoff wall is actually necessary. The Risk Management Center has developed the RMC Risk Management Plans Toolbox as part of the RMC Risk Calculations Suite of Microsoft Excel spreadsheets to help you with these calculations. The spreadsheet tools contained in this toolbox quantitatively assess the effectiveness and efficiency of risk reduction for an array of risk management plans, including as low as reasonably practicable or ALARP considerations to help risk-informed decision-making. This spreadsheet can be downloaded from the RMC website. Click Software from the navigation bar, hover over RMC Toolboxes, then RMC Calculations Suite, and the download link for the toolbox will be at the bottom right. This concludes Session 2 of this course. Be sure to complete Homework 2 to get credit for completing the session. In Homework 2, you are given a stage frequency relationship, some sets of breach and non-breach life loss consequences, and system response probabilities for four internal erosion failure modes. Although it is not shown on this screen, you are also given the project event tree. You are asked to calculate the risk and to generate the little fn and big fn charts. You are asked to use 10 even intervals to include non-exceedance and to use semi-logarithmic interpolation for the system response. Also for exposure, you will want to use 11 hours for daytime exposure. Once complete, please send your completed homework to rmctraining at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS-105, homework two to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with homework, please reach out to the instructors through the email address on the screen or by emailing us directly. We will go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you will be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you missed the live session, a recording will be posted to the RMC website. The quiz will stay open until the day of the next live session. Please check the course schedule for dates and times. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you again in a couple weeks.